It's really good to see all of you. Welcome to everybody who's here in person for our annual meeting. Welcome to everybody who's joining us online. Thank you for coming. The Lord be with you. Remaining seated, let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, source of all wisdom and understanding, be present with all of us who take counsel for St. John's Cathedral for our renewal and the mission of this community. Teach us in all things to seek first your honor and glory. Guide us to perceive what is right and grant us both the courage to pursue it and the grace to accomplish it. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'll turn things over to our senior warden, Lee Grinstead. Thank you, Richard. Good morning. My name is Lee Grinstead, and I'm the senior warden here at St. John's. Um, I want to thank you all for joining me here today for an important piece of business in the life of the cathedral community. Uh, to let you know, based on the number of ballots that have been submitted electronically and the number of people here present today for the election of the new vestry class, it appears that we do have a quorum. Uh, so thanks to all of you who voted in advance. For the record, this meeting is being recorded and a transcript <clears throat> is also being generated. A copy of the recording and the transcript will be posted online after the meeting is concluded. We've asked that Shirley and Bob Trachino will um, ask, act as members of um, the Teller Committee Two people doesn't really make a committee, but you get the idea. They'll be our clerks today. They'll be counting ballots for the election of new vestry members. So thanks to both of you, Shirley and Bob. As for the minutes from last year's annual meeting held on January 31st, 2021, I believe that you have copies of the minutes uh, from last year's annual meeting on your chairs. And for those of you who are watching from home, you can see those at um, sjcathedral.org slash governance. Um, I'd like to receive a motion and a second to dispense with the reading of those minutes. <laughs> hint, hint. Michael Kackner moved and uh, I'm gonna go with Michael Vante. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, all in favor, say aye. aye, okay. Any opposed? I didn't think so, okay. That motion passed. Um, so with that, I'd like to move on to vestry elections this morning. Um, for those of you who are not, um, who are here in person this morning, we're gonna be passing out paper ballots if you have not already voted. Um, each member can only vote once. We are here in Denver, not in Chicago, right? So our clerks have, for, sorry for my Chicago fans, um, our clerks have a record of those who have already voted. So even if you don't remember whether you have or you've lost track, they have not. And duplicate vote, votes will be um, set aside. So paper ballots must include your, member, your name, the member's name, and a signature in order to be counted, okay? So it's important to note that voting is gonna conclude around 9.30 this morning, so um, hopefully you are decisive, you know who you're gonna vote for, and, and we'll collect those immediately. Um, I'd like to thank all the nominees for their willingness to stand in the vestry election this year. Uh, Stefan Burris, Kate uh, Go. Gokovic, Bradley Jackson, Jennifer Jones, and Helen Richards. Thank you all. I also want to thank the outgoing vestry class for their time and commitment. Um, and in another year where we've really faced some deep societal divisions and challenges, their continued commitment and faith to this community um, is amazing. Helen Richards, Meg Parrish, Elizabeth Drummond, and Jennifer Allen. 
I'd also like to thank Robin, Robin Polson for her work as clerk and Angie Thompson, who left to pursue a calling to attend law school midway through her term. All of them cared deeply for this place and we could not do the work that we've been able to do over the past several years without their passion and dedication, um, the dedication of people like these. They're really incredible leaders, all of them, and I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart. I also want to recognize the rest of the vestry who've served with me over this past year. As I said last year, and I'm going to say it again, with really, they've served with patience and kindness, uh, creativity and strength. The strength of this body and the faith of this body is truly inspiring. If you are unsure of who serves on the vestry, please remember we're your elected re representatives and you can put faces to names if you visit our website sjcathedral.org slash vestry. On Sundays you can also identify us by our name tags which I will put on before I come back up again next. They're little red and white ones. And please don't hesitate to reach out and let us know if there's something that you think we need to know or any areas of concern. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Boney for a hymn. So thank you, and I'll see you again in a minute. time, with all of our pastoral ministries remaining vibrantly active, folks writing cards and letters, the Care Advisory Board that deals with some more practical matters, our Daughters of the King who hold us all in prayer daily, Eucharistic and pastoral visitors going to hospitals and homes, our spiritual directors who give of their time and meet with so many of our parishioners in a generous way being a spiritual companion. And the Stargazers Widder, Widows Group has continued as well. One of the ways we've tried to expand uh, pastoral care during the pandemic has been by enlisting parishioners to call on others in our community. This was incredibly important in the early days when um, we were trying to live stream services on a, a phone and um, we weren't meeting in person at all. 
The first one happened in June of 2020. The second happened right before Christmas in 2020. And finally, we were thrilled to be able to have a calling campaign, which we were calling Stewardship of Relationship, um, this fall to announce we were finally coming back into the nave. These calls have all been incredibly important to our community and to remaining connected. Some of the details of the call this fall, you can see specific numbers in your leaflet, in your uh, booklet, but just an overview. We had 44 callers who volunteered, and some called as few as five, and some called over 20 folks. And they called over 500 households. And we had to figure out where do we get those names of the people who are really plugged in. And so we used the pledging, the folks who had pledged in the previous year. This was not a call campaign about pledging, however. We were very clear about that. So, um, we all know that we have to put out information in lots of ways for it to be heard. So, clearly, the voice, announcements on Sundays, and social media are not enough. So, we called you to say, please come home. Come back. The nave is open. Some of the other priorities of this call, just as in the previous call campaigns, was simply to ask folks how they were doing. How are you holding up? What's changed in your life? How can we be present to you, holding you in prayer? Can a member of the staff or clergy call you? Everyone who asked for a follow-up was contacted in short time. We also checked to make sure that folks were staying connected to St. John's through all of those ways I just mentioned. In addition to, do you know we're streaming all of these services? And I would have thought all of you knew. <laughs> I'll just say at least one person didn't know. And they were thrilled. So, um, and also to remind people that we also have small groups that have continued through this time. Another important aspect of this call and of all previous calls was to make sure that we have your most accurate information. I am thrilled to tell you, the first call campaign in June of 2020, we received, and I am not exaggerating though I'm prone to, thousands of pieces of information that needed to be updated in our database. Thousands. The second round of calls, there were far fewer, still a lot, maybe hundreds. This call campaign, 37. So we are making serious progress. Lots of you have retired. Lots of you have moved. We've gotten rid of old phone numbers because you don't use landlines anymore. All sorts of things. But that alone is incredible. And please, don't make us chase you down for your new information. If any of those things happen, you retire, you move, you get rid of your landline, Tell us. And while it wasn't the purpose of the calls, our folks were prepared to answer questions. Can you imagine what they might have been about? Chairs. <laughs> uh, the move to print fewer leaflets and the need to mask in the building. And some of you actually asked about pledging. We did not start that conversation, but you did, thankfully. The response from folks was overwhelmingly positive. Streaming has been a game changer for so many of our people. You can now worship from anywhere. If you move across the country, we know Broderick's mother is a faithful watcher. <laughs> if you are sick or you are on vacation, you can join us. And we have so many people who found us online during the last 22 months and are joining us. I have several in my catechumenate class right now. It's incredible. And I'm glad to report that this unimagined benefit of a pandemic is not going away. I want to extend a huge thank you to Christina Rutland for her assistance in this project. As you can imagine, it is not simple. And all of the callers have our deepest gratitude for their time and faithfulness to this community. Thank you. Good morning. 
Yuroslav Pelikan, the church and credo historian, has said that tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. That one line is a succinct way of describing St. John's 20s and 30s community. Over the past four years, a monthly rhythm or tradition of brunch and a theology podcast has developed. On some occasions, 10 people are present, on others around 30. That is tradition. Traditionalism is being faced with the reality of not being able to safely gather in person for some time in 2020 and 21, and never amending that rhythm. From August 2020 through April of 2021, we held our first ever digital Bible study that began with a wellness check-in and continued with group discussion of Revelation, a fitting biblical book for the present moment. Traditionalism in that time would have also been continuing with the model I had, I, I had employed since arriving here in 2017, a top-down form of programming that is primarily shaped around a charismatic staff member with no lay-led input, planning, or vision. Thanks to the addition of Christina Rutland to our young adult ministry team, the gracious creativity of Lee Horton, Kate Goykovich, and Scott Dijkstra, our model has thankfully shifted to one that will long outlast any one person's enthusiasm and charisma. Over the course of pastoring and partnering in service with young adults at St. John's, I have learned invaluable lessons that gathering people around tables is not something, not just something that Jesus did, it is something the church at its best does too, a tradition worth keeping. Before I introduce Christina Rutland, um, Evans, Owsley, and Audrey have asked me to say, if you have not yet voted, this is your last call, please pay attention to Bob Trittino or Georgie Brooks Myrtle and give them your ballot as they finalize the vote. Um, it's my, I, I do want to introduce one person today. You, you know everyone who's speaking, but I, I do want to introduce Christina Rutland for, for one reason. And that is, um, Christina is going to seminary, which is wonderful. So congratulations to her. <clears throat> Christina is at the midpoint of her fourth year with us here at St. John's Cathedral. And, and we, many of you know this, but not all of you do. Our youth group has grown um, numerically and spiritually. Um, they, they've grown in terms of numbers and they've really grown in terms of depth in Christ, the kinds of conversations they have, the trust they have with one another, and the trust they put in Christina, and ultimately we believe in, in Christ and in the Spirit. Christina's done an amazing job. We do not look forward to her leaving the staff this summer, but we do want you to know that so you can wish her congratulations. We're very proud of her. That also means in a month or so we'll um, post a new job description for the youth minister and undertake a search that, God willing, will lead to another wonderful youth minister who will begin with us this summer. Christina, welcome, and a warm welcome as well to Elizabeth Williams, who's a graduating senior and a very active member of our youth group. Thank you, Richard. Can y'all hear me? Great. So thank you so much, Richard. Um, I will have a chance to share my gratitude of, of being here, but this morning I only have five minutes, so we're going to focus on the past 20 months in youth group during the pandemic. So as Richard said, my name is Christina Rutland, and I'm the youth minister here at St. John's. This morning, an active youth member and I, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Williams, will discuss how youth pro programming has gone during the pandemic. Since March 2020, we have experienced an increase in numbers and more importantly, great engagement in our programs. Youth volunteers and I delivered care packages, held youth group on Zoom, walked and talked in parks with youth, and explored where God was in this pandemic, giving us the space to express what we were feeling. 
After the death of George Floyd, our high school youth group dove into an Episcopal curriculum called Dismantling Racism, along with the youth group at St. Barnabas down the street, where we discussed how we as Christians should respond to systemic racism in our country. I'm excited for Elizabeth to tell you more about her experience in youth group. I've loved getting to know her these past few years. She's really grown into someone who readily expresses her perspective. She's a great example to our younger, younger youth, and she has a very deep faith. So, Elizabeth. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Williams. Um, just a little, a little bit about me. I'm a senior at Cherry Creek High School, and my family has been attending St. John's for about 11 years. So Elizabeth, what has been meaningful to you about youth group over the past 20 months? So as you said earlier, we've had a big increase in involvement despite youth group going remote. So of course that was very positive. The collective improvement and engagement encouraged everyone to just want to participate more. So we had much deeper conversations. And this got into not just like daily lives, but also connecting our stories to deeper messages. It wasn't just the high schoolers working hard at developing this community, though. Um, it was also all the youth leaders. They all shared their experiences with us, helped teach concepts in a way that we could understand and relate to, and they were always part of the conversation. For example, one lesson once included everyone jotting down ideas, describing how God was present in our lives in three different ways. And we also watched this Michael Curry sermon to learn more about this topic we were learning about in the Bible. And so all the leaders participated in the brainstorming part and also the discussion of the video. So that just helped encourage conversation. So where have you experienced God in sharing your story within deeper conversations, specifically in our conversations about racial justice during dismantling racism and mental health? So for me, I experienced God most when I could feel myself in the group growing. Our growth was mostly about gaining understanding and sometimes the growth would feel good because we were just feeling more solid in understanding ourselves and the world around us. But sometimes um, the growth was a feeling the sense of conflict from an injustice we were learning about and we realized we wouldn't end the conversation in complete comfort. But either way, no matter what type of growth was happening, um, we were all honest with each other and always shared how things felt. So this vulnerability and everything that we learned made us all feel close to God because it built community and trust. With mental health learning, we learned how to view all challenges with more validity and grace. And with dismantling racism, we learned how not to ignore reality or injustices and embrace and discuss difficult history and current events. And all of these skills are very challenging, but in learning them, we all bonded as a community, so we had a great outcome overall. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for sharing. Our high school youth group had an incredible experience last year in the fall of 2020 and spring 2021. And our middle school youth group also had great engagement and numbers during that time. During this fall of 2021, we have, ex we have seen our current ninth grade class shape the youth group community, and it's really exciting to witness. Also, a new group of sixth graders started their journey in youth group this fall. Our middle schoolers are sweet, engaging, and brilliant. I think even challenge our high schoolers a little bit. And another thing about Elizabeth is she's a member of our youth ministry team where we discuss ways of how our youth program can continue to grow. While we've seen a lot of growth, there are ways that we can really strengthen the community as well. So thank you to that youth ministry team, our youth volunteers, and youth and parents for your support and dedication. Good morning. My name is Fran Trujillo, and I coordinate the projects and the volunteers at the apartments and all the ways that St. John's interacts with them. I'm here to give you a quick update. Uh, first of all, and you may not realize this, this we're, 
they have been there for four years, and we have been involved with them for that entire time. I would say the only time we weren't was the first month when they moved in, and beyond that, we have always been involved with them. Um, there are 30 residents now of the original 53. However, the apartments are always full. Sadly, we lost nine residents who passed away over these four years. Um, and every time that has happened, there has been uh, a memorial service held for each of those residents. Richard has officiated at, a, at several of them. And so we continue that connection spiritually and in every other way. Our purpose has always been to do things with the, the residents, not necessarily for the residents, although there is a for aspect in everything we do. We have a team that does gardening with them, with those beautiful rooftop gardens. We do a monthly meal um, just so that they can get together because that's a huge need that the residents have. We have a team that celebrates birthdays with them every six months, uh, cake and ice cream and fun. Um, we have a team that when, when COVID hasn't been around, we're, we're able to take them in a van to Metro Caring and Walmart. Um, and we have a team that works on workshops and interesting things that the residents might uh, be involved in and help grow. Um, we have a brand new project that will start this next month. And one of the things that we've discovered that residents need most is the opportunity to get together and just talk. Um, they live in their separate apartments and because of COVID, they have been locked down a lot over the past couple of years. And so one of the things that we're going to be doing, and I'm pleased to say that Richard is going to be kind of facilitating some of this, um, is one Sunday after, after church, um, every month, we're going to gather a few folks to go over and just sit down and chat. We'll, have, we'll take some food with us so that they have something to munch on while they're chatting, but it's just to chat. It's not um, anything beyond talking about what they're interested in. And these days, it happens to be playoff games with the NFL. So it can be almost anything. I am so pleased and I want to make sure that I leave with one major, major thank you, not only to the staff at the cathedral who are always so supportive, but to these amazing volunteers who absolutely never give up. And even when they couldn't do anything during COVID, they were still interested in wanting to know about how the residents were doing. Thank you so much, volunteers. Before we continue, let's give Fran, Elizabeth, and Christina a round of applause. That was great. Thank you. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. So I'm going to invite forward all of the people who've been involved in our HVAC project and who've had a hand in this project, and we want to acknowledge them and we want to um, thank them. And the first person I'm going to start with is Mike Baxa. Mike is a, a member of the cathedral, um, a great dad, and works in the construction industry. And Mike has just been instrumental in this project, and I want you to know why, and I want you to understand this. It's a great example of lay leadership. I could tell you a lot about the advice Mike has given us, but I want to give you one or two quick examples. Mike knew that the, the heat in here was failing, all the steam heat pipes um, below the, the floor. And he and I have been brainstorming about what to do and how to, how to jump on that because that could be a potentially a nightmare, especially on Christmas Eve. Um, and we'd been brainstorming about what to do, looking for, for a household to fund it potentially. And I'll never forget this. And I have not told our architects or contractors this story. But it was, it was shortly after COVID, so it was probably summer of 2020, of 2020. And you know what that felt like in the world. And Mike came to me and he said, we got to do HVAC right now. I'm going to tell you why. I was like, what? He said, right now. He said, um, 
contractors, we're hungry right now. <laughs> Everything's kind of falling apart. If you move now, you're going to have great bids and you're going to get better pricing. And I'm going to tell you, he said, what's going to happen once we hit the, the last quarter, if not earlier, of 2021, construction is going to explode and people aren't going to want this project and your pricing is going to go up dramatically. Now's the time. I said, Mike, can we pray about this? <laughs> um, but, but that advice, if you just encapsulate, I mean, God is good, Mike was right, the timing couldn't have been better. And we basically, I mean, there, there were one or two little headaches for the contractors, but we basically beat all the supply chain issues that y'all are now in the midst of, basically, with one gigantic exception. Um, <laughs> But we basically beat all of that. I mean, I, I never would have known. The vestry would have never known. The finance committee never could have known. The treasurer could have We would never have known. We don't have that expertise. That's lay leadership giving us advice, getting their hands dirty at the right time. Mike, I'll, I'll never be able to thank you enough. Give him a round of applause. <clears throat> it's an honor to be here with um, DZ and Greg Cooper, who work for um, France and Pittman. Um, DZ waved everybody if you don't mind. Um, DZ was the superintendent for this project, and um, I, I want to tell you this about this guy. He knows what he's doing. DZ and I have the exact same sense of humor. Um, <laughs> DZ and I just relate to one another, and I, I, I've loved literally every second with you. I mean, your humor and just, just charisma on this project it has meant the world to me. Um, you and I have sometimes driven Audrey Chapman crazy a little bit, but I enjoyed that too. Um, <laughs> really, you, you, you've just been a, a joy to work with. And Greg Cooper, I want to thank you for your integrity. Um, you've known for us, this was, this was, you're not dealing with a bank on this thing. This is, we're not even a school. This is a big deal for us, and we had to get it right with no margin for error. You hire great people. You look us in the eye. You compromise when we need you to. I'm really, really grateful. Thank you. It's been a joy to work with Franson and Pittman. Leah Hankey and John McIntyre work at Triba Architects just down the street for us. That firm um, has done great work here in Denver and in the whole state for a long, long time. They're devoted to this neighborhood. They're devoted to Denver. Even though they do, they do a lot of new and, and really creative um, and mind-blowing projects um, that are new, that their, their heart is in um, historic preservation. John and Leah love this place. They've been great to work with. And just, just one or two quick examples. Um, they have just drawn beautiful things that look like they've always been here. This grill, I mean, if you notice it when you come up to communion, I mean, just look, there's a grill on top of all that fretwork, and it used to be plexiglass that was, that, was, that was reflective and looked like it was added in like 1978. Um, and now with that grill, which they took a stained glass window, a Gothic window, and kind of turned it upside down and just pulled it in a little bit of an imaginative way. And it looks like it's always been there. Um, notice all the fretwork, the woodwork, all the millwork in the, in the narthex um, when you're coming through. When we finish, and they're almost done, and we'll have a date for you here soon, but when they finish all the work in Dagwell, in the common room, I was in the common room, and in the nursery. Nursery's getting first time ever HVAC system. The nursery's getting first time ever HVAC system. The chapel, the sacristy. But notice, I was in the common room this week and saw all the millwork that's in that matches all the millwork right there, that takes that same theme around the top of it. It looks like it's always been here. We're in your debt. We're grateful. We can't wait to work even more with you. Paul Miles is our project coordinator. Um, Paul is just, ama <laughs> is just amazing. Um, it's one other thing Mike Baxa did. Mike Baxa said, you got to hire Paul Miles to run this thing. Um, and I, because we're in church, we try to be honest here. Um, <laughs> Mike said, Greg, you'll really appreciate this. Mike said, 
he, he'll be mean to the contractor when you don't want to. <laughs> and when somebody has to like really come down hard, you need somebody. I know you, Richard. You're too much of a pastor. Um, <laughs> we, need, we need a project manager who, who's going to get on this. And, and, and Paul's just been, I mean, just, just amazing. You, you, you too, like Greg, have known that, that for us, this is a big deal. Um, we don't do this very often. And we had a, a, a wonderful gift, but just mean we had to get this right. Um, you're also an abs- you've got a um, you got a great smile, and you're a joy to work with. I've loved being with you, and can't thank you enough. Um, and then Audrey, you know, Audrey's our director of operations, and and she's been here five years. I've been here almost five years. Um, you know, you ask before they leave. Ask anybody on this team why things work well around here. And it's Audrey Chapman. She's kept up with every one of them. I mean, she's kept up with every payment. She's kept up with every deadline. She's kept up with holding everybody to their word. Um, she, she, I mean, you, Audrey, you have just gone above and beyond. It's truly one of the great honors of my life to, to work alongside you. But Audrey, Paul, John, Leah, Greg, DZ, Mike, from the bottom of my heart, my heart, and on behalf of St. John's Cathedral, thank you so much. Thank y'all. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tom Barber, and. I'm humbled to serve as the treasurer of the cathedral and uh, the chair of the finance committee. So I get to talk about everyone's favorite topic, which is the finances uh, from last year. So uh, the theme I wanted to put into this report is really around being intentional. And uh, by that, it means acting with purpose in mind, making regular conscious decisions towards a desired outcome. And last year, uh, we St. John's had the opportunity to act intentionally in many ways as challenges and opportunities provoked actions that required careful, considerate collaboration and clear communication across the cathedral. Some of the noteworthy examples include, uh, on the bad side, the erosion of revenues from the Kimberly across the street due to some aging in the building. On the positive side, some of our intentional things we do, like rebalancing with regularity, our endowment, proved uh, to work quite well for us. Also, the construction around the cathedral and the way we had to use our space, as you heard about, uh, through these and many more circumstances, uh, we worked across the leadership teams to very intentionally try to guide to a sustainable, healthy future of the cathedral. The operating budget is a a very good marker of the health of of, uh, the cathedral. And when the Kimberly apartments um, started to come offline due to some aging and and issues with the apartments, it really uh, provoked and ignited a a major effort within the leadership teams to say, we need to really jump into this. Um, Many people jumped into action. Uh, Experts were brought in. Uh, some of those people that jumped into action and experts are in this room. So you can probably try to look around and thank them uh, for the things they've done and things that they will do. Um, on the expenses side of the ledger, our, our largest expense really in any organization is, is your human capital and salaries uh, of the employees. Uh, the dean and his staff have really, really worked masterfully to uh, carve out the operational roles you heard about Audrey and and everybody else uh, to to run as lean as possible and be able to go as uh, small in staff and expense as as possible. Um, But it will demand more investment in personnel going forward for the cathedral to to be healthy. In the case of both revenues and expenses, the congregation has intentionally contributed in major ways. Uh, Last year, our combined pledge plate revenues exceeded our budgetary planning, and our heartfelt thanks goes to everyone for your generous financial support of the cathedral last year. 
the generous contribution of time, this is really important, and not always recognized through volunteerism, really helps augment the staff as well to help things run here at St. John's. Uh, one of the greatest examples of intentionality uh, is also the donations that we get. Um, 2021 saw major uh, gifts that we saw about uh, the uh, HVAC project. And also, after three quarters of a century, we sold some mineral, and I say sold because this just came through a couple of days ago, uh, some assets that we've had since 1948 that are gonna give uh, the cathedral the opportunity to really look for the highest and best use of these funds. On capital expenditures, you know, our buildings and grounds is an ongoing endless project. And last year, through savings that we've had, we've been able to finance projects such as tree removal, uh, evaluating an important leak above the organ, uh, security systems upgrades, AV optimizations, and stained glass evaluations, just to name a few. Our reserves are healthy, thanks to the vestries voted emergency fund that we have. And at all times, we keep three months of payroll uh, for all of our staff in our checking account following best practice for small businesses. Now everyone's favorite topic is always the audit. And every year the audit has a very similar report. And it's always very healthy and we talk about uh, deprecating uh, you know, some buildings, things that we do every year. This year, what I really wanna do is highlight our accountant, Chris Jenkins. Uh, she's really, really the magic behind our audit along with Audrey and others but she's a great Wisconsinite and an even better accountant. And every year uh, our audit goes extremely well and our audit committee is led by Chuck Thompson, Jay Swope and Tom Barrett. But this really, really shows every year how well this place is run. So looking back last year, we had a lot of opportunities to act very intentionally uh, in some challenges and in some opportunities. Um, in all cases, the intentional actions have moved us closer to a sustainable future. And looking to next year, uh, your congregation's generous pledges have helped us to balance the budget and actually add to our staff, which is a really, really important point. It's the intentional generosity and all of God's grace that fuels our future. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Tom. Again, I'd like to thank everyone who's really been willing to stand for election um, and for anyone that, when we find out the results, who may not have been elected. Um, as you know, there are many wonderful opportunities for service here, and I know that we'll find other opportunities um, for you uh, that will be right to get involved. Um, I may be calling on you sooner rather than later. Um, and um, we don't have results yet, but they will be out in the next few hours, days, and you will hear very soon. Okay. So last year I presented to you um, on my remarks online, and I was thrilled that we could do it but I spoke to an empty cathedral um, space, and I would say that it, it really broke something in my heart that day. Um, I'm so happy to be here today and to see your faces and to be here with you again and to know that still more of you are at home and are joining us there. Um, once again, I'm coming to you again during some rather unusual times. I had hoped, and I know that many of you had hoped as well, that this year we would find the world calmer and maybe with the pandemic behind us rather than still our constant companion. Um, but I know that over the past year, many of us have had to dig deeply to find reserves of grit and resilience that we didn't know we had. Despite all that darkness, I've also found that during this past year, there have been many chances for hope and for honesty and healing, and I've found them here at St. John's in this beautiful community and space. It's this community of people 
that I've turned to again and again and that have helped hold me together and brought me a sense of purpose and light in an otherwise tumultuous world. I'm so grateful to all of you, the parishioners and the staff and the clergy and my fellow vestry members who really make to make this cathedral what it is today. I also really want to echo um, Tom Barber's words and say that I too am so grateful to all of you that pledged this year. It's been an overwhelming show of faith and support and it will allow us to fulfill our mission. So thank you, thank you, thank you. The vestry is charged with the leadership and finances, the buildings and grounds, and once again, I'm very happy to report that we are in overall healthy shape. And it's for this re very reason that we've chosen this time to assess and plan for the future. We know that one of our buildings, in particular, the Kimberly Apartments, as Tom mentioned, across the street, is aging. And as it serves as low-income housing rental units, we have a moral obligation to make sure that the structure is sound and well cared for. We've just finished a detailed architectural, structural, and systems assessment of the building, and we know that soon the vestry will need to make some faithful decisions. Please be assured that we'll be thoughtful about our mission while balancing our hearts and minds. We'll be looking at our financial resources and carefully balancing the moral imperatives we have to care for our tenants, along with caring for the buildings and making sure that we don't invest too much money in antiquated systems that can't be salvaged. It was with this in mind that we decided to step back and put the Kimberly Apartments in the larger context of our overall campus. As some of you may remember, in early December, I wrote in the Cathedral Voice about a new initiative, a campus uh, stewardship and revenue planning task force. This small group, led by Vestry member Jennifer Allen, is charged with developing and refining goals, an approach, and a process for considering options related to all our spaces and buildings. The primary focus of this task force is on stewardship and revenue generating opportunities for long-term sustainability of the cathedral and its grounds, which basically stretch from Colfax to 13th. We're doing this now so we can confidently shepherd our resources and support our missional work. Those that started a church in Denver over a saloon the first services were over a saloon. I don't know if you knew that or not, but remember that, keep that in mind. They did that 162 years ago. They couldn't imagine what it would be like today. And we're trying to plan and then act on what could be in 16 years, 62 years, and even what we could do to support those that come in 162 years. For the past two months, this task force has been meeting with Triba Architects who facilitated our discussions. Our conversations have been informed by past campus planning initiatives, including previous master plans, legal agreements, vision documents, reports, and assessments, so that we're not starting from scratch, but rather building on the foundation of what has come before. What we've uncovered is a really deep desire to do missional work to serve the needs of those in Capitol Hill and Denver at large, to carefully steward our resources and create a sense of community. One of the things that the staff and clergy learned when the church was closed for services last year and there was an encampment of more than 100 people on the sidewalks surrounding the cathedral is that our neighborhood here in Capitol Hill has a variety of different opi differing opinions and ideas about people experiencing homelessness, which is true of other areas um, around the city as well, and the country. But we also learned that everyone from people who live in the nearby apartments, to business owners, to nonprofits in the neighborhood, they're all very disconnected and very isolated from one another. And the pandemic has just exacerbated this sense of isolation and disconnection. Long before the pandemic, though, 
one of our parishioners rented an apartment in Capitol Hill and described this, that period of his life as being really quite lonely because the area didn't feel like a neighborhood. It didn't feel connected. Now, obviously, this anecdote is only one person's experience, but we believe it holds a really strong a grain of truth. And that truth helped us start to think about how the cathedral's potential partners and our grounds could help better connect our neighbors with one another and with the place and the people of St. John's. We don't know exactly how to do this yet, but Triba Architects is very interested in this idea of building connections with the neighborhood in a variety of ways, and we are too. A summary of findings and a set of drawings to provide a base for project design development and budgeting purposes has just been created and will be posted on our website and um, passed out and, and available in paper form as well in the cathedral in the coming days. So keep an eye out and a, um, for information in the voice and a link once it's available. And as always, email vestry at stjohns.org if you have any questions. In addition to strengthening the fabric in our neighborhood and how we can be, further be of service to those in need, the task force realizes that we must maximize the use of the Roberts Building for income potential during the week and provide project design options for adjacent parcels. We know we have to do this because the Finance Committee and the Vestry spends many months each year reviewing a five-year plan. And although the outcome has improved greatly in the last few years via a mix of expense cuts and growth in the endowment and an amazing growth in pledges, as Tom mentioned, we still see projected deficits five years out. So we're looking at a balance of both short and long-term strategic moves that we will pursue in tandem to generate income streams to support the cathedral's work in the world. In the coming weeks and months, we'll be bringing key stakeholders together to provide feedback to the vestry. This is a cooperative and evolving process, and you'll continue to hear more and be asked to comment as we move forward. Thank you for your time and your attention this morning. I look forward to working with all of you. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Lee and Tom and everyone who've made great reports. I just want to add just a, a few thanksgivings and, and note a few things um, from the reports in the packet, and then we'll have about three or four, maybe in five minutes, to take questions from the floor or online. Evans Owsley will walk around with a microphone if anyone in here has a question. If you're watching online you have a question, please put it in the chat and it will get to me. But just a, a couple things, a couple more thank yous and then a few things to note. I want to thank, um, we have a wonderful um, chancellor whose name is Larry Keeter. Larry succeeded um, Bob Bach, and I think Larry's, Larry's in here. Um, Larry's a longtime member of the parish, a former senior warden, a great soul, and, and um, chancellor, we give him that title of chancellor because he's, he's paid in the kingdom of heaven, if you follow what I mean. So we, we give him, the Episcopal Church has this wonderful custom of, of giving you a fancy title as a way of saying, thank you, and this is so important, and in the communion of saints, you will be reimbursed. Um, so, so do know that, that, that Larry gives, all of this is pro bono, his work, and he does just a, a marvelous job. Every now and then what we need is, is his wisdom or perspective on something that's a little complex, um, and we... You know how we've done all these, the HVC project, fixing the leak with the engineer that has plagued this place for a long time. All of those projects and all of those people have contracts. And Larry approves and edits all of those and gets them in the right shape so the cathedral is, is protected and we're all on the, on the right page, um, same page. So just Larry, profound thanks. Um, I also... Remember, he started a little over, it was before the HVC project, it was about a year and a half ago, I think, and I remember we, we talked, and I said, Larry, 
I mean, it's really kind of quiet right now. Um, I don't think there's much upcoming. I think it'll be pretty, uh, pretty. And then a month later, I think Audrey sent him the Franz and Pittman contract. <laughs> and then on and on. So you, you, you've been really generous. You've been really wise. You've been really patient. So, so much, much thanks. Um, I, I want to thank um, Mark Weary just stepped out. He's one of our dean's uh, vergers, um, and just does a marvelous job coordinating all of the services, along with s- serving on um, our finance committee and serving on the vestry. Mark does a great job. All of our servers um, who serve everything, you see them on Sundays, but they serve all of our burials and um, just do a marvelous, marvelous job. I love that they've got a really they look you in the eye and they've got a gentle touch. They know this is serious and solemn and reverent, but, they, but they've got just the right gentle touch, I think, that, that goes a long, long way. So a huge thank you to all of our servers. Um, what I want to draw your attention to, though, is for the sake of time, we, we limited some of the oral reports this year. Um, and so I really want you to pay close attention to the packet Tina Clark did a a wonderful report. We'll probably have her speaking again next year. Pay attention to to it, um, and especially her work with with youth and children. The Grants Committee report, grants are chaired by Kathy Gravely. They do a marvelous job. They do a lot of work. Um, I'm so proud of what they do. And you'll see all of the grantees um, for the year listed um, in the packet as well. Pay close attention to that. Pay close attention to how they, how they categorized what the priorities are for the year and why. I think that's really important. And I'll say a word about that in my sermon at 1030. Please um, pay close attention to two more reports that you just might miss. Um, one is all of our small groups and about, about 20 of them are listed, just so you know about them. They range from Bible studies to prayer meetings to grief groups to a widow's group. They're just powerful and wonderful. And if you're looking for, sometimes the cathedral is so large, you've got to scale it down to get in a small group. We've got those groups for you. Um, pay attention to that report. And if you ever want to know more, or you feel like there's not something there for you, let me or Katie um, know, and we'll do all our, our best to either find the, the group that exists or start one for you. Um, small groups are a huge essential piece of what we do to make sure you feel connected here. And then last but not least, pay close, close attention to Audrey Chapman's report. Audrey always does a great oral report, but, but this year we just didn't quite have the time for it. Her report is beautifully written and goes through all the capital projects we've done in the, in the past year, including fixing that leak, goes through um, what we've done financially to reduce the endowment draw per the vestry's charge um, to our staff going back almost five years ago now, literally five years ago last month, if I remember Tom Keys. Um, and some financial forecasting, but do read. It, it, it's really important that you read Audrey's report. It gives you kind of the full of picture of what, what all goes on in the back of the house, so to speak, and especially Monday through Friday around here. And I'll draw your attention to one piece of Audrey's report. If, if you asked Audrey and me and, and probably Mike Baxson, a few key people here on Vestry and staff, and especially Rebecca Richardson, who's on Vestry and Arts and Architecture, more than likely our next big upcoming um, project that needs to be funded, that's going to be wonderful, is a, is a thorough stem to stern renovation of our stained glass windows. Um, it, it's urgent. And I'll hi- highlight one piece of why it's urgent. All of the windows behind me in the chancel were all put into, originally put into wooden frames. They are currently still in those same wooden frames. You, if you've got good enough vision, you can see it from the outside. Look up one day on the other side of the chancel, and you'll see those wooden frames and the deterioration of those. It's urgent we get to this project, and we're assembling as we speak a great team to get us a plan, a budget, and a timeline, all the right trades to get this work done. And it's not just those windows. It's all of them that need some attention. So, so I commend that to your prayers and your attention, especially in these next couple of years. And with that, I think we've got about three or four minutes. Evans Owsley, is that correct? Three or four minutes for questions. So if you have one, if you'll raise your hand, Evans will come to you with the microphone.
anyone. Oh, I love questions. <laughs> okay. Thank you for being here. Do we have any other announcements for now? So Evans has let me know that votes are still being counted, so you can expect. Um, Evans, Ashley, if you don't mind helping me, that will be announced. Is that announced via email? It'll be, you, you'll get a, a, there'll be a parish-wide email that'll go out uh, tomorrow or maybe um, tonight where you can get those. Again, as Lee Grinstead said, a, th- a huge thank you to all five people who are running for those four spots. That really, really means a lot. Thank you so much. Above all, thank you for your time your prayers, your generosity, and your presence. It means the world to us that all of you are here, the ways in which you lead this cathedral, and it's a joy to work with each and every one of you. God bless you, and let's prepare for the service at 1030. And for all who joined us online, please join us for the service at 1030 as well. Thank you.